curiosity box which is our um, sort of monthly resources of teaching of teaching resources and videos and stuff like that we've been looking at um, rote teaching in particular and we did take a couple of them I think you did S for storm didn't you Sharon and I, I know and D for day, daydream uh, yes I, I taught the teachers um, because of course um, not everyone has had the chance to be taught um, a rote piece, so I was teaching our members uh, D for Daydream, which is the most gorgeous piece. I know that Jean's going to be playing through these pieces in just a little while. Yes, and I, I did get a, um, I know Claire, I don't know whether she's here actually, but Claire, who's in the, in the community, said, um, that she'd got a student who was feeling quite unmotivated and she taught the student S for storm last week. And as a, as a consequence, she spent the whole week improvising with it. And she, she actually videoed her pupil and shared that with us all. And uh, that, that, was, that was so lovely. And Veronica also said she wrote taught D for daydream to two students. And wow, both the lessons ended relaxed and zen. Even the students remarked on it. So the power of June's pieces <laughs> to zen a lesson. I love that. that. <laughs> Hello. I'm going to get June to come get over. Get her in. Formally introduce her, June. I'm going to let you sit here and I'm going to give you the warmest of, of warm. Hey. Oh, hello, Sally. Hello, everybody. Hello, June. Uh, just a real privilege to be here and to be able to introduce you all to Alphabet. And uh, I've been uh, blushing over there with all these lovely comments. And <laughs> D for days and F for storm. You know, you write these pieces and you don't ever think the, the consequences. Yes. No. No, no. I, I mean, I've had two of my students learn those two pieces as well, and they've, they've really, really been enjoying it. And, and it's interesting just looking down the comments here. Um, of course, you know, I think you've become um, a better known name because some of your stuff is also in ABRSM, this current syllabus, isn't it? And you're also in some of the other um, piano syllabuses as well. So, um, you know, uh, everybody's now getting, getting more familiar with your your lovely style indeed and um i mean june and i go back to june oh, and yes. very long time <laughs> in fact i do remember the very first time meeting you at um do you send us that's workshop? right it was a cinema break young came to northern ireland and um, to, to hollywood hollywood in northern ireland as well um and did this wonderful day workshop and pretty sure you were the regional organizer for Dr. Was, Belfast yes. at that point so that's when i first met you and we have done lots and lots and lots of things uh, since and June uh, was one of my wonderfully influential teachers as well so yeah I can't tell you, I can't start to tell you how excited I am to have you here today and I knew that just recently you have hit 5,000 in terms of the seals of your books you've been composing for 10, Ten years, years. Yeah. and you got first published seven years ago so and it's it's still rocketing for um mm. providing us with such wonderful um and very very thoughtful um thoughtfully composed music which i think is well it's all still just um uh, amazing to me that anybody's playing this stuff <laughs> but you're anyway, too modest. No, too modest. you write it. You write it for yourself, and you just hope that someone else will like it. And that's really it. Yeah, yeah. But I think what you do is is you've caught partly a spirit of the time in that you know we're we're trying to um, allow our pupils to be musicians at the piano right from the start yeah. rather than just starting on single notes and and just putting things together very slowly like that where it feels a bit inhibited really you've kind of o literally opened up the keyboard uh, you and, uh, and other people but you know uh, opened up the keyboard and the world of the piano to all these young students and they just love it june so thank you so much from all of us for that sorry because i think the reason i started to write was i'd run out of I found making music to teach. And I actually started writing much more advanced music. And then I went backwards 
in grade level in standard and I was I just kept thinking well why can't we have atmospheric music why can't we have impressionist music why why do the little ones have to lose out and that's how it that's how it happened yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it okay worked, it worked for my pupils and uh, so I just kept going down I don't think I can go down much further <laughs> <laughs> I just need to come back up again <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so shall we shall we crack on with a bit of alphabet then? Without further ado, so guys, we do want you to keep your questions coming in. Sally and I will be monitoring those, and we will be stopping Jane every so often so that she can Please answer do. your Lots questions. of questions. There you go. So I'm going to pass over to you, Jane. Thank you very much. I'm I, th I thought probably the best thing is I will just play each of the pieces in alphabetical order so we don't get confused. Um, they're not in order of difficulty, but I'll just go through them in alphabetical. I'll play one and then I'll talk a little bit about it. So the first one is A for Angel. So that's A for Angel. Now this is certainly a challenging piece. It's one of the harder pieces in alphabet. And most of the challenge lies in feeling the pulse when there's nothing happening. And that's something I'm very big on, training that feeling of pulse that goes through a minim, dotted minim or semi -bree. So many children, as I'm sure you all know, are not too worried how long minims, semi breeze and dotted minims last, <laughs> as long as they're a bit longer than a crotchet. So it, it's really developing that sense of pulse. And there are all sorts of things you can do uh, to develop that. Um, I'm sure you all have your own ways of doing that. Um, you can just simply fill in the pulses. I have uh, these wonderful castanets, I should have brought one with me today. And so, Clap, clap. So that the, they can't escape the pulse. It's very easy just to cut that short. If you're teaching this piece, I would start off playing it at pitch where it's written. So that they become very comfortable and then move it up one octave. Maybe they don't want to move it up two octaves if they're very small or move the stool up. Uh, and the pedal is held right down, but I would learn it here and then move it up and move it up. And that also gives a sense of the keyboard geography as well. So I move on to banjo. Mm -hmm. um, B for banjo. Now, I played this to one of my own pupils last week, and they didn't know what a banjo was. So maybe that's something you need to talk about as well. But when I described what it looked like, uh, they, they were, oh, yeah, they knew what it was. And there are a lot of two note slurs in the alphabet. Uh, I'll talk about them in a bit later on. Um, a fairly straightforward piece. Uh, you, you might want to experiment with your pupil's staccato touch. Um, something a lot of uh, pupils find uh, challenging. They're not quite sure how to make a note short and they can become tense or jerky. And so sometimes I will just get them to flick their finger back uh, just as a way of hearing how, how short the note rather than poking at it, which a lot of them 
would be prone to do it. So maybe a little bit of flicking um, just to get that really nice and round. The uh, next piece is C for Carousel, which is of course the Carousel horse on the cover. And this is a very straightforward piece. Uh, it's a legato in the left hand, and then just a very relaxed uh, right hand on the, the two uh, notes, the semitones in the right hand. So we've got D sharp and E, and then we've got E F. So I would get them very comfortable with, with doing that. Anywhere on the piano. White and black combinations. So they've got a very nice relaxed wrist. shifted one position just in the middle so make sure that they're comfortable doing that. Now a lot of children like to use whatever finger comes to hand. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> this is something that uh, you know, June. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Can I can I just say if you could just project your voice a bit more right. um, that would be people are saying if you could just speak a little louder that would be great. So I think the microphone is needs to is is a little way from you so if you could project that would be lovely right a lot of children um have like to use whatever finger comes to hand and then use different fingers on various occasions so i would be quite insistent on this that we do this with two and three which which are the longest fingers and the easiest ones to do that with is that okay now? I think we've got a comment, yes, that's better. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I don't think there's much else to say about carousel. Uh, so now we move on to D for daydream. we have the left hand crossing over and playing octaves but each octave descends a note each time so we G F and E and D and then G right down to C the right hand in the middle is playing a two note slur and again as I said there are a lot of two note slurs in alphabet so I would work on the the actual drop and lift with that so that the, this becomes a very natural action right throughout the piece. And I prefer the left hand notes to be played with the third finger. This piece, of course, can be taught by a goat uh, and would be very difficult for a child at this standard to read. But I always like to bring them back to the score and we explain and look at the notes and understand where they are, even if they can't immediately read them. So the next one is E, E for echo.
So this piece is all about dynamics. Um, you can have a very, very straightforward three bars of M, uh, three bars of forte, even if you like, and then change the echo in the fourth bar and eighth bar, the end. Uh, there's a little bit of challenge at the, at the end of this piece uh, where we have the left hand, I'll just bring it up. So we, we have qu quite a busy line on the bottom here. So what I would suggest doing with that is being very comfortable. from the end, we have an extra note in the right hand. And that F will be a little bit challenging, but if they're comfortable with the previous two sets of bars, that should be fine. Are there any questions so far? <clears throat> yes, I'm wondering, Sally, is it a good idea just because we have got quite a bit of chat here? Yeah, I think yeah. We've, got, we've got a couple of questions. Um, now I'm just going back a bit. We had Juliana, and you've you've sort of said, um, gave a, given a bit of an answer. You said, um, "Can you ask June if she teaches these pieces by rote?" And and I did love your your comment on that, June. That I wondered whether you could explain a bit more. That yes, you might teach it by rote, but you always bring the student back to the score, so that they start to understand what is actually on there. Yes, I I never teach by rote. In isolation. No. Uh, always it is a combination of breaking down the score. Um, the, when I use rote is where, when a child is having difficulty moving forward with the score and it becomes much quicker by using rote. Yeah. Um, but I never just say I'm going to teach you a piece by rote. Uh, I would maybe do it. We play around with little things at the beginning of the lesson, and I play something and get them to play it on the piano without showing them the music. But that's different from teaching uh, an entire piece. Um, I, I like to develop both of them always at the same time. I think that's a really, really valid, valuable point that you've made. That you always bring the student back to the score, and yeah. you know, if if we think about the way that. Uh, that students learn to read in terms of words and things, the, the, the reading just doesn't come out of nothing. They're already familiar, aren't they, with the written word and things like that. And actually, this is exactly what we're doing here. We're just exposing them to what notation looks like. So it becomes a familiar friend to them rather than something to be worried about. Because yeah. I know you okay. your S for storm piece. What I did with a student earlier on, just at the beginning of the term, was they learned it by rote, but their homework for the following week was to write it out. Mm. So it's, again, yeah. that's another way of just bringing them back. Yes, that, that's something I like to do a lot. And try, I'm doing, I always do something different every term with my pupils, and this term... I remember I, that! I used to love that! Like, what's going to be this term? Uh, this time, it's, we, we, um, I play them something, they play it, and then write it out. Yeah. So they're always interpreting the written, um, the notation. We, we were talking about this earlier on today, weren't we, actually, about one of my students. Anyhow, we won't go down there. But we have got, um, I think it's Justice, I'm not sure, um, who asks, um, would you suggest using alphabet as a supplement to lesson books, thus focusing on technique in a fun manner? It says, um, Dozen a Day is a classic, but can be a bit boring for some. Dozen I think the answer is yes. I, I, I love Dozen a Day. I use Dozen a Day. I've always used Dozen a Day. I'm still using it. And I use it in extremely inventive ways. <laughs> uh, but what I love about it is the, the child knows exactly where they are. They know where the notes are. So you can focus on the actual point of, of the exercise. And I um, encourage them to learn them by memory. 
because uh, it has good for memory as well. So I quite often I'll draw a little box on their practice sheet and they have to fill in the box how many of their, let's say they've got four to do. So it's a number between zero and four, how many they can play by memory. And the sun is the middle of the big four. And, and no, we can't remember them all. <laughs> but um, I, I like them to do it by memory because that makes sure that they really can get rid of the notes and are focusing on the technique. And I, I think, sorry, I'm just, just to butt in there. I think what he said, oh, I don't know whether it's he or she because I can't quite see the name. So apologies to that person. Um, but these could, the, the, your alphabet pieces can be used to supplement it can be used also for technical purposes yeah. as well um you know to 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 add to the dozen a day to complement the dozen a day i think can't it yes yes um, i i certainly i would be using dozen a day along a piece as well and um, everything i write has got technical purposes yeah 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 that, lovely my sort of raison d'etre for yeah, writing okay. at the very beginning yeah, yeah. Yeah, incorporate yeah. technique into something which sounded nice as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. if you go on my website, there's a there's a the, on the there's a thing about studies or pieces. So that's the, I mean these are studies, but they're yeah, yeah. but they're pieces, aren't they? Yes, yeah, yeah. And just just raving here about D for Daydream, <laughs> and she's saying it has it has both the technical ingredients to wrap up the learning journey of. Of one of her pupils who's finishing off the uh, ele elementary level of the the piano framework and for those of you that are not members of the community the piano framework is a um, uh, a step-by-step -step sort of guide to uh, navigating your way um, through a progression really uh, for members of the community okay should we should we move on Sharon move on to F for fun. F for fun. okay F for fun yes please complex than it looks or sounds with the coordination between the hands so it's a little bit challenging at the end it's just simple triads just played in close position and the last two notes are of course F for fun um, and then we have G for glider and I was talking earlier on about the importance of two note slurs and the relaxed arm action so glider is a perfect exercise if you want someone who needs a little bit of development in that direction. They've done a lot to not <laughs> slur. So that's basically what's going on through the whole piece. And they don't have to move the hands in that one. And then H for harp um, is again a, a triad piece, and we're just sitting in triad position. And then this is just hand over hand triad playing. And if they can imagine that they're strumming up a harp, and that will encourage speed into that. The faster you play it, the more harp like it will be. 
So a little bit of encouragement there to get a bit of finger dexterity going. And we're up to I now, I for isolates. hand movement we move down for each bar but apart from that there's very little hand movement in this piece and it's a, a series of thirds and those are all thirds then we move down the the ends of some of the cadences we have to think carefully about which notes which fingers we're going to use in each hand but other than that, it's quite straightforward piece. There is a, a longer bar at the end, a 3-2 bar, it's 2-2 two, two throughout, but that will just fall quite naturally. Now, I have a, I have a little girl and I just gave her alphabet um, last week and I played her some pieces I thought would be suitable for her and this is the one she picked, J for Jolly Roger. just starting to play hands together it's quite an impressive sound for the left hand to make. Again it's very straightforward and so with my own pupil we learned the right hand and then we learned I got her to work out how to play the last two bars just by herself. So the fingers are moving together and she's able to do that and then next week we're going to Bring in that big left hand. K for kangaroo is one of the easier pieces, and it's all about getting a really sharp rhythmic sound. hands together piece and it's in C position so it's easy for them to recognize. If I was teaching this I would ask them to look at the left hand pattern first so not only are they going to move to a new bar and think oh my goodness I don't know what that note is but they understand what the left hand is doing which is moving down by step. G and then from F. And I always like my pupils to have a, a, an analytical understanding of what they're doing as well as reading and muscle memory. I like them to understand patterns uh, at all times. So that's what the left hand is doing. So the left hand is very, very simple. Uh, and then once they've got used to, they, they can learn the right hand, it should go together quite easily. Oh, 
although having confidently said it should go together quite easily, there are a lot of unusual combinations between right and left. So maybe a little bit challenging as well. What's next? M. <laughs> M for Moonbeam. I think this is my favorite piece. Uh, and it's by far and away the hardest piece in the whole book. M for Moonbeam. And as of course you can all see the challenge is that first bar rhythm, one, two, three, four. That, that's quite challenging. Um, so a rote approach with that is helpful as well. When we come to the final descending uh, theme, uh, I think it's lovely to use both hands. You're coming down, use the left hand for the F sharp and the right hand to finish. And I think I've written that somewhere in the notes in the book. That's just a nice little touch to add to that. But it is a challenging one. Can I pop in with a couple of questions, yes, June? Because we, we're, we're all having a lot of fun over here, so I thought I'd share it with you as well, because we're loving listening to all your pieces. And um, it's, it's justice, I think. Think who I was trying to pronounce before sorry about that she says thank you so much um, for the information about playing by rote and she also says have you had students transpose those into various keys some of the some of these pieces can they transpose them I see no reason why not I, I don't think I tried transposing moonbeam but yeah no some of them would work wouldn't they but not others well um, yeah Lullaby, you can take that into G or F or D or anything you want to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Rachel just wants to say that she's new to your work and she's not at all confident at teaching by rote, but she's saying that beginner lessons could be less stressful in future if she tries out your pieces. Oh, hooray! Yeah. Hooray, yes, ab absolutely. I hope that turns out to be the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, and she also comment. Oh, Rachel comments that um, you know doing these sorts of pieces actually um, can cut down on dropout rates, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I've actually just sort of commented there that once you get the right balance of a in a lesson, so that the lesson is has some of the pieces let's say that you're playing alongside i mean i do a lot of musicianship stuff in my lessons you know we we do singing yeah. we do solfa could i kind of bass stuff alongside the reading those all going along together and all of a sudden you know students are just loving what they're doing and what's more the parents love what they what they hear they suddenly hear music don't they yes i i think that um but I, I, I find, well, my piano pupils, you know, I sort of expect them to say, oh, she's written another book. <laughs> but uh, they, they just seem to take to them. And, well, I'll just reveal that as, as, as a, a very nice secret. I, I'm always so chuffed when I say, right, we're going to learn a new piece. Is it going to be out of your, whatever it is, your joy of first year piano? Or is it going to be out of alphabet? They always go, alphabet, <laughs> or, or whatever the book is. So that's always so lovely. You know, I, I, would be very, I wouldn't be wounded if they chose the other book. But they tend to, to go with these because they, they are more colourful, I think, for them. Mm. And yeah. I think that's why they like them, yeah. because of the, the colours, yeah. which you, yeah. you, know, you don't get in little baroque pieces and yeah. Yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually have met two children, a um, brother and a sister, and they've both learned every single piece in safari. <laughs> the what entire the book. book, they learned the entire book. So I, I gave them a copy of Seaworld to move on to. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But you know, it, it, I've, I've heard that quite a lot, especially with Safari, uh, that kids just want to play so many pieces from that mm. book. Mm. It would be nice if Alphabet was the same way, but I don't know. There's something in Safari, I think, that uh, yeah. I don't know if it's the animals. Or, um, we've we've also got a, a comment here from Margaret that she uh, Margaret Priest that the pieces are really descriptive and enjoyable, but there's still a place for you know things like the Chester's and the Paul Harris sight reading. And oh, yeah. I think going back to what you were saying about teaching by rote, you know, we're not we're not saying one is better than the other. We're actually saying it's the balance, isn't it? Balance. Yes. yes. Well, I would never teach uh, a pupil of my own on the diet of my own music. I would never. Do that. Yeah. It's a supplement. Uh, because yep. there's many yep. other types of music that, that you have to address as well. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we move okay. on? Okay, let's move on. Let's, let's keep keep going. Going. I, I'll show you the score because quite often teachers will contact me and say, what do you mean? What exactly do you mean by those open-ended slur markings? And they literally just mean the note rings on. You don't have to hold it for the specified uh, note value. Uh, I'll show you again. The second one is a crotchet. But the pedal will be on and you can just release the note. So this is M for night. So several things about this piece, the, the first four bars and the second four bars are the same, but the left hand D flat and E flat fifths are reversed. And the second time, and so that's the only difference. Then at the end, the right hand has to play one of those fifths, the D flat fifth. And I put an optional pedal change on the final chord. So that's the same as the beginning. Then here, left hand, now the right hand plays the D flat fifth. And I really love to encourage them to learn the gutter pedaling as soon as possible. So when we play the final chord, up. They don't even have to put the pedal back down again. They can if they want. And you'd be surprised how many children can do that. And that's just a little feeder for when you want to get into more serious legato pedaling later on. Uh, I always think introducing it as soon as possible, and most pupils do have the understanding and the coordination. And that's just one single instance, and uh, up, and then we've learned how to do that. O for Ole.
Now, a couple of things to talk about P for Pagoda. If you're able to watch my right hand, which I hope is closer to you, uh, it's all... all relaxed rotation. Now, a lot of you might think it's a bit early to be thinking about rotation, but uh, I'm, I'm not averse to, if the child can do it naturally, even at this stage, to start thinking about a little bit of, of using this to play it rather than the fingers. At the end, um, there's a pedal marking for them when they've played the, the penultimate chord. Then just to put the pedal down, release their hands. And this is training them to find new positions before they need to play. So we have our chord, pedal down, release the hands, and while they're counting. And again, that's something that I like to develop from very early on, and it's, it's one of the most important tools in piano playing that you prepare in advance. And this is a, a, an example where you can do that very easily and get them to let go, prepare, and then play. Q for quarrelsome. I, I had quite difficulty finding a suitable name for Q, but anyway, I decided I needed a, another lively little piece, so quarrelsome. <laughs> to move everything together. So we've got to leave the left hand and it's walking up by step while the right hand moves up. So that's quite a coordinational challenge. the triads hand over hand triad and we actually have a rainbow on the page if any of you have seen the book you will have noticed the rainbow but if you haven't I'll show you the rainbow. The notation would have looked much better notated with left hand, right hand and then back in the, the bass clef and the treble clef, bass clef but it doesn't give you a rainbow. S for storm. And I wonder if any of you can uh, tell me what this is a, a homage to. Because I, I actually write a lot of pieces which there's, there's a little homage to pieces that I love teaching. Wow. 
well. Yep, we had Angie in there straight oh away God. with this, <laughs> you the can't storm. Miss, can you? It's no. a lot, of course, by Bergmuller. And while yeah. we're talking about Orage by Bergmuller, the storm, the thunderstorm, Bergmuller's Opus 109, I think, are some of the most wonderful pieces ever written. Technical studies. Mm -hmm. I think that's fabulous, and I, I've used them probably more than any other music that I teach with. And that's one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, it's a straightforward piece and can be taught, as we know, by rote. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> right, we're on to T for to the Bogan, which looks one of the easiest pieces in the book, but it's actually a huge challenge, especially if your pupil is one of these ones who wants to play everything as fast as possible. We all have some, yes? And nothing will do what will go as fast as we can. And uh, this is all about controlling speed. Uh, as we're pulling the toboggan up the slope, the slope gets deeper, the toboggan gets heavier, we go slower. And then as we go down, we get faster. But it, the real challenge is going up and achieving that slower tempo each time. And, and I think it's a great exercise for small, it tends to be small boys that won't particularly go as fast as they possibly can. Now it says slower. And then even slower. Very slow. And that, that is actually a huge challenge. So um, it looks easy. We're just moving up in five fingers from C, E, G, and B. But uh, it is challenging. Then on the way down, I would get the pupil to find their C, where we're going to land at the bottom with the left hand, and start off slowly as we come down in groups of four fingers. A little exercise in four, three, two, one, four, three, to bring your fourth finger over, which is terrific pr preparation for we start doing two octave descending scales, and quite often that fourth finger doesn't want to come over. It's always three is favorite. So that's a little exercise in working on that four over. You for upside down. <laughs> in each hand or mirror image. So with two issues here we have the staccato. That's quite a fast staccato, although you can play any of, can I just say you can play any of those pieces, these pieces at any speed that works for your particular pupil. That you, and I, I, a lot of them I have not put in metronome recommendations because at this stage it depends on what your pupil can manage. So we have the staccato, repeated C, challenge in itself. And then we have the three note slurs. So that's introducing another note into the two note slur. V for volcano. And this piece literally is built out of three notes, four notes, E, F, F sharp and G. And there's not much else in it.
I played this last weekend at a, at a workshop where I was playing some pieces to children and not telling them what the piece was about and yet asking them what made them think of. So can you all guess what they all said for that one? Sharks. No sharks. <laughs> uh, so this is, we have a D sharp in there as well, but apart from the D sharp, it's just built out of that little pattern all the way through. It's an exercise in building dynamics as well. Right, are we all right for time? W, mm -hmm. W for water fountain. And I would get them to be comfortable with the left hand, C sharp, G sharp. Then G sharp and E. And I would do that first to make sure they're very comfortable with it. The right hand plays the same thing the whole way through. So again, get them comfortable with that. They can do all of those. They can play water fun. And that's definitely something you can teach by rote. And it would be quite difficult for them to read that. But again, I would bring them back to the score and look at how the, the score relates to what they're doing with their fingers. X for Xanadu. And this is an exercise in legato playing. And it's maybe at the challenging end of alphabet for the hands together coordination. Why? For yacht. Now, yacht is in 5 4, and a lot of people might say, oh goodness, we don't want to know about 5 4 at this stage. But it's, it actually makes a lot of sense. So I would get the pupil to learn bar two, which is this. So we have a triad, and then we just have C, D, E, D, C. Go back down the triad, up. I'm not very comfortable with that. I mean, that doesn't really sound like five, four, does it? <laughs> it's a... Uh, well, maybe it does. So once we've mastered that, then we're going to play the D and the E as crotchets. And then we can put the whole thing together. straightforward little piece. And sadly we've come to Z, the end of the book. And this is Z for Zephyr. That was a challenging one, but I was very happy with Zephyr. Very atmospheric piece. And I would use both pedals for this. And I also suggest in the book that you start the right hand with the second finger, but you also play it then with the third finger. And it's one of these free pieces uh, where we have the open-ended slurs and no bar line, no time signature. So it's quite a challenge in just allowing things to sound and settle and then decide when you want the breeze to move on. And you'll probably have to tell them what a zephyr is as well.
you can hear from that that there are just two patterns. With that, the whole way through that. So that takes us to the end of alphabet. Say there aren't more letters in the alphabet. <laughs> so are we. And it certainly sounded like this lovely, sweet, soft wind. Oh, yeah. the atmospheric. Super. 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 So, um, there are a couple of questions. There's lots of people saying, um, and, and Justice is, is in America and she's purchased the books and she says she can't wait for them to get to the States. Um, so she's got some transfer students who have gaps in their technique and this will really help them, she reckons. So fantastic. Good to hear that. Um, a question. Um, Mary asks, in T for toboggan, why not teach a C major scale fingering? Ah, right. T for toboggan. Oh, the, oh, the descending, right, I couldn't work that out. Sorry. Uh, the descending one. Yes. Why not a C major scale? Mm. Well, if you, if you want, do it with a C major scale. Okay. I explained why I did it in fours because we're training that fourth finger. But if you want to, you can yeah. do it. Or do the whole thing with the right hand if you want. I mean, do whatever you want. It's just a template. But. Um, I like the idea of the, of the force coming down. Yeah, I do too, because it works, doesn't it? Could you In fact, the C, ma you know, the C I, I, major scale is the hardest, hardest scale to get the fingering right with. I, and, and the other thing I would say about that, I would have thought that an extending C major scale at that speed was too difficult at this stage. Mm -hmm. Whereas just bring over your four, bring over your four, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, so it yeah. was to make it easier, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, Mary. So uh, there was another question. I think Kath was popping in with a question about aquamarine in paint box. She was saying, "Could you pop in with a question?" Well, you can pop it there, Kath, and then and then we'll see if we can uh, have have a time to to look at that. Um, yes, lots of people sort of saying had a trio of pupils learning S for storm in the whole in the school hall last week. Nina's saying she's taught it to four different students. And somebody else was saying, I think it was Claire, was was um really taken with your N for night and saying, Halloween, that's a Halloween piece. And I went, Oh yes, I think I think she's right on that one. I can feel yes, that's right. No, yes, Claire said can't can't wait to teach N for night for Halloween. Um, and I've put your a link to June's uh, website where you can buy all the music. I've put that up there a couple of times for people, and I think it, I'm right in saying it. You've got a fifth, a fifth of the price is off everything yes. at the moment. I, I don't ever put my music on sale except for special occasions. So this is to celebrate selling five thousand books. So it's one fifth off for five days. And can I just to say to everybody out there? I've put a disclaimer note on my, my uh, website because my husband has gone to America for two weeks and our internet went on the blink last night. So I, I yeah. cannot deal with these issues. <laughs> <laughs> you may have to place your orders, but if worse comes to the worst, I should be able to see them through the iPad and get them off to you anyway. But uh, there could be small technical hitch here. But let's okay. Okay, I'm just going to, um, Rachel has uh, kind of popped back on and she said her connection dropped when I was addressing the point about finding the balance between rote and other methods. Would you be able to repeat it? Um, I think it was a question of us saying there's got to be a balance. We're, we're, we're saying that, um, you know, rote helps the inner musician to to get activated and and helps to kind of touch the the music making but there's always got to be a balance with things like uh you know learning to read as well as developing technique and and that sort of stuff it they all go and i do a lot of musicianship stuff i think i was saying as well 
June, can you remember what you were saying at that point? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trouble. Um, but I will say that uh, there are certain children who would just love everything to be taught by rote, and they just the muscle memory that's all they want and mm. they're resistant to reading and so I, I would personally if I'm going to teach something that much by rote they would have to write it out mm. yeah 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 I just wouldn't let them go away and that's it and they have no idea how they did it no yeah. no, no absolutely and I, I I would also like to say, I think a lot of children who are taught to read the music using a more um, sort of just notation based approach in a tutor book from the beginning, um, actually they are learning by rote. They're not really a lot of the time able, some of them anyhow, to read notation very well, which is why we tend to get a really big drop off at around grade two or grade three, because the difficulty level of reading both hands at the same time actually defeats them at that point in time. Because up till then, they've been very good with their very sharp ears. Children are very bright. You know, they're able to pick things up. And it's our job as teachers to really be able to diagnose whether they are actually understanding that written uh, that written notation so the sort of thing June is saying getting them to write it out really shows you their level of understanding I'm just going to suggest because I was doing this in lessons earlier this week so you can see here it is a floor stew um, and what I was doing in lessons was getting a student to write out it was just the melody for Ode to Joy and I had those little erasers, you know, those little rubbers, and they were plotting it on, on the stage. So again, for the children who need to, you know, who can't sit for 30 minutes at, at the piano bench, because it's, it can be hard work. They have to actually start to think hard about sitting still and focusing. Um, just to get them off the bench and doing something like that for five minutes can really just stimulate the energy again, bring them back to the piano, um, and they're, they're kind of good to, good to go. So. I know I find it difficult to sit still for 30 minutes, so. I've <laughs> <laughs> got one other question. This was a question that came through via email from Anne and she says, any tips for helping adult beginners with finger independence, particularly in the playing of intervals and chords? Mm. Jim. That's a good question because where orders differ, <laughs> when adult learners don't have that lovely rubbery dexterity mm. that, you, that the little ones do. What was your question again? So, tips for any tips for dexterity. helping them with finger independence? You mean playing two fingers at once? I think so, and playing, you know, chords or triads. Well, not, I can't really think of anything except go from what they can do to something a little bit more. Make sure that they, they well, supposing, supposing they're having trouble playing one on five. Yes. Whichever. Well, let's say it's one and five, but they can play one and three. And then I would get them to add the five. So they're happy with the one and three. Now let's get the five as well. And then not the three. Which is a completely different feel. Mm -hmm. yes. So find something that they're comfortable doing, extend it to what you're trying to do, and then remove the, the comfort zone. And possibly even moving around because I've been, I was saying to someone quite recently about how way back when I first started teaching piano and when things were boring, we, everything was in five finger positions in the middle seat and where you were kind of, apart from the fact that you've got the elbows in and it was this idea of, because I guess this was the way I'd been taught, that you have to and it's like literally peeling your fingers and it's like, okay, that's where they've got to be because then they'll be ready for the notes that you're playing. But of course you end up with this very stiff tense. And when you then go play intervals and triads, that's when you know the notes don't sound together. So I guess it's just, it's doing it and having a sense of relaxation 
Yeah, well, the relaxation is, of course, very important. Um, there's also, adults sometimes have problems with the notes not sounding together and getting split notes. And I think one of the best things for that is that they're trying so hard physically to do it, they stop thinking about the physical side and they just listen. Oh, split. Oh, back that. to the important so listen. listening mm -hmm. is what triggers your muscles and getting them to listen rather than work trying to work on the muscles getting to work by the ear and listen to that sound and they will then start to hear and once they, they they've heard that they won't ever do it again look they might but uh, they, they won't want to do it again because they now know what they're trying to achieve and it's coming from the brain and not from physical action Key, the, bra the brain and the sound, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just going to change the subject before we finish because I know lots of people are, are leaving us now because they're off to teach. But just to quit this quick question from Kath, I don't know whether um, June can address this or not. She said, um, her students tend to play aquamarine from Paintbox, I think, in 6-8 to get the flow. Is there a reason for it being written in 3-4? What an embarrassing question. I know that even was a long time ago, wasn't it? What time signature <laughs> in? Uh, it is in 3 4. Mm. The, the pulse yes. is three beats in a bar. So yeah. that's what the composer intended. If you want to play it and feel it in 6 8, I see no reason not, the composer sees no reason not to do that. Okay. I mean, it's, it's only, there are only notes on the piano. And, yeah. and the fact that would actually be a very good exercise for someone who's learned it in three, four, saying, now let's hear it in mm -hmm. six, eight. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then, then write it out. The people who want yes. to play it in six, eight, yeah, then write it out, of course. The people who <laughs> want to play it in six, eight, and it in six, eight. Yeah. Hear it in yeah. Three, Okay, so I um, just want to sort of finish off with a few more uh, lovely comments. So Helen has said, thank you so much, June, for your wonderful music. It's very inspiring, both for her pupils and for your teaching, for her teaching. And it has and will transform my lessons indeed. Um, Joanna said, um, A for alphabet is amazing. Oh, thank you, Joanna. And she also says, the, and Joanna's only been a member, I think, two, two weeks or so. She says, the Curious Piano Teachers is an amazing community. I can't believe what it's done for my teaching already. <sighs> That's what we like to hear. Um, and Rachel is saying she's always up and down from the bench during lessons. So that sounds as though you're very much on the... Um, on the right track. So um, Diana is saying thank you for the webinar. Never heard of Alphabet and it is great. Um, and Kath is saying it was a great lesson on comparing the two K's. Not sure what you mean, but we just wanted your permission. I think she means on comparing the two time signatures, but they wanted your permission. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Key signatures. Key signatures? Time yeah, signatures, don't you mean? <laughs> yes, she says. She means time signatures. Okay, lovely. Okay. Rachel, if you want to find out more about the community, she's just asking, here's a link. If you just click on that right now, that will take you to the join page. If you've got a question you'd like to ask before you join, just email us on info at curiouspiano.org info at curiouspiano.org or you can go to that that page but uh I, i'm going to hand over to to sharon i'm just going to say june thank you so much really really lovely and i just love alphabet and yes do keep it up won't you those compositions please she will indeed she will indeed because she's just been telling him you're about to go and have some tea and cake and Nothing um she will be telling me all about but no there is more new stuff in the pipeline and i know that everyone here has had a wonderful time i know that sally and i certainly have so no i've had a lovely time it's, it's always lovely to be able to play your music to, to somebody who vaguely wants to listen to it <laughs> he loves it 
do please. So just again, we want to say a huge, huge thank you to June. Um, and we want to say a massive thank you to you guys for being here. I know that you will be going out now to teach. Some of you have already left to, to teach. And no doubt I will have been inspired by the gorgeous, deeply gorgeous music that you have been hearing. So have a wonderful day wherever you're listening from. And if you're not should, yet, we, mm -hmm. should we just tell people that they will get a, a, a replay, won't yeah. they? They'll get a link with a replay coming. And if you want to keep in touch, if you're not, if you want to keep in touch with the curious piano teachers about future free webinars, because we've got one coming up in November, then uh, we'll also put in a link for you to be able to go over and sign up to our mailing list. Because uh, you know we we have lots and lots and lots of things in the pipeline, which are very exciting. Absolutely, for sure. And if you're not yet a member of the community by the curious piano teachers, then um the link is the curious piano teachers.org forward slash join um and we'd love to have you in there so have a wonderful day and we will see you soon bye for now bye